Corporate fraud works best in the shadows, behind corporate walls. How does the government bring these wrongdoers to justice? Whistleblowers. These are the stories of those who risk their careers to shine a light on allegations of fraud. Today on Fraud in America. There are growing concerns about dishonest corporations and individuals cheating the system, illegally tilting the economic playing field in their direction. There are stories about opponents of anti-fraud laws peddling lies, doubt, and misinformation on Capitol Hill and in the courts, all with the goals of poking holes in the safeguards that protect all of us. Taxpayers against fraud was created for moments like this. You see, when the evening news ran stories about $900 hammers and $3,000 toilet seats being sold to our military, it was Taft's early members who were up on Capitol Hill encouraging Congress to revive the Federal False Claims Act. And when Congress passed the 1986 amendments to restore the False Claims Act, it was Taft's founder, John Phillips, who took action and launched Taxpayers Against Fraud to safeguard the act from future fraudsters. And in the 1990s, when opponents of the False Claims Act sought to dismantle the act, the government's primary weapon against fraud, it was Taft that successfully pushed back on that effort in the media, in the courts, and in the halls of Congress. We were created for moments like this. And in 2000, when the United States Supreme Court was faced with the issue of whether or not the False Claims Act key TAM provisions were constitutional, it was Taft who retained the leading Supreme Court advocate to fight for our cause. Then, a few weeks after the Supreme Court agreed with our argument, it was TAF that launched a sister organization to focus on educating the public, the courts, and the legal community about the KETAM legal practice. This organization, known as Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund, quickly grew from 40 to nearly 500 members and is widely regarded as the voice, heart, and soul of the whistleblower legal community. It was TAF that anticipated additional attacks taking place in the courts. In fact, over the last 22 years, TAF Education Fund has filed over 150 amicus curiae briefs in every circuit court, the U.S. Supreme Court, and in several state Supreme Courts across the country. We were created for moments like this. And when fraudsters increasingly turned their eyes to state government programs, we crafted a model state false claims act and educated state legislators about the anti-fraud capabilities of the false claims act. Now, 33 states have false claims acts to protect their limited government dollars. And when fraudsters increasingly defrauded the IRS, we testified about how an effective IRS whistleblower program could help in the fight against tax fraud. The end result was the IRS whistleblower program that has recouped billions from tax cheats. And in 2009 and 2010, when several court decisions greatly limited the reach of the False Claims Act, it was our leadership who testified in the House and in the Senate about much needed legislative improvements. The resulting FARA amendments restored the reach of the False Claims Act to protect all government dollars. We were created for moments like this, standing shoulder to shoulder in protecting federal and state government programs from fraud for nearly 35 years. But fraud is not limited to government programs. Where money flows, fraud follows. And as modern day fraud becomes more complex, the need for robust whistleblower programs has become even more urgent and apparent. This is especially true when it comes to fraud in the financial markets. So, we have also led the charge to fight fraud in the financial markets for nearly two decades. Indeed, leading up to the Great Recession of 2008, we raised concerns that the financial markets were increasingly vulnerable to fraud. And when Madoff whistleblower Harry Markopoulos testified before Congress, 
Taft was in his corner encouraging Congress to strengthen and encourage SEC whistleblowers to step forward by offering them greater protection and incentives. And when Congress heard our arguments and enacted legislation that created the SEC and CFTC whistleblower programs, we helped to educate the chair of the SEC, the chair of the CFTC, and all of the SEC and CFTC commissioners about the role that whistleblowers could play in uncovering financial fraud. The resulting SEC and CFTC whistleblower programs have returned billions of dollars to unsuspecting investors. And today, Taxpayers Against Fraud remains a strong guardian of these laws on Capitol Hill. And its sister organization, Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund, has expanded its mission over the years to fight fraud on the government and financial markets. Indeed, while Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund focused initially on the Federal False Claims Act, Education Fund's expanded mission now includes 33 state false claims acts, the IRS whistleblower program, the SEC whistleblower program, the CFTC whistleblower program, and most recently, FinCEN anti-money laundering whistleblower program, to name a few. So Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund finds itself with a name that no longer fully captures what we truly do. Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund as a name served its original purpose of highlighting that we educate the world about fighting fraud that impacts the government. Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund, however, doesn't fully capture where we're focusing today and in the future. So it's time to update our name. Our updated name should reflect our collective mission to stand together against fraud. Our updated name should reflect our expanded mission to protect government programs and the financial markets from fraud. Our updated name should represent our diverse group of supporters and members, not just the False Claims Act key TAM attorneys that are members of our organization. Our name should reflect all of us and all that we do. So Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund is updating its name to the Anti-Fraud Coalition. The Anti-Fraud Coalition, or TAF Coalition for short, will continue forward with our current mission, but gone will be the confusion over why we are against Fraud Education Fund or that we are somehow a standalone inside the Beltway think tank or that we are somehow solely focused on tax fraud. So while our sister organization, Taxpayers Against Fraud, will continue under its current name given its long-standing name recognition on Capitol Hill, the Anti-Fraud Coalition will continue building its identity as the coalition of whistleblowers, key TAM attorneys, financial fraud whistleblower attorneys, and other supporters who fight fraud in the financial markets and on government programs. There is tremendous power in clarity. And our new name, the Anti-Fraud Coalition, clearly announces our joint mission to move forward together against fraud. So that was our big news. And to help walk us through why we decided to make this change and the impact uh, that the organization has made over the time, there's no one better to talk to than the chairwoman of our board, Erica Kelton. Erica, <laughs> welcome to our show. Thank you, Jeb. It is fantastic to be here. So this has been a long time coming. It has been. Yeah. And now it's here. It's a great occasion. So I can't wait for people to hear this interview because you have an amazing backstory, which we're going to get to in a little bit. But let's get into the big news. Our new name. Why yeah. did we decide the Anti -Frog to make this change? Coalition, Love Taft that. Coalition. Yeah. Well, it was time. You know, when Taft Taxpayers Against Fraud was founded uh, in the late '80s, um, it was focused on frauds against the government, the False Claims Act, and key TAM whistleblowers and practitioners. But over time, you know, we've added more and more whistleblower programs, the State False Claims Act. 
IRS program. Then in 2010, Dodd-Frank came along and established the SEC and CFTC program. Then motor vehicle safety. Then anti-money laundering. Then kleptocracy. It goes on and on and on. And I uh, anticipate that over the years, there will be more whistleblower programs that come under our umbrella. So taxpayers against fraud, we outgrew it. It didn't fit as well. And we needed a broader umbrella um, to capture all that we do, to capture the whistleblowers that we represent and that we want to support, to capture the lawyers that who are the members, and to appeal to the public generally. Um, there was also the issue of confusion, as you know. Yeah. Taxpayers against fraud. Takia, you know, mentioned that during tax time, in the run-up to tax time, you guys over at TAF offices would get calls from taxpayers oh, ne <laughs> needing help on their returns. Or Jackie DeMar saying um, in, uh, she was invited to be a speaker at a conference, and one of the organizers said, Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund. Why are you guys against fraud education? <laughs> so the Anti-Fraud Coalition, um, it, uh, it, it solves that, those problems as well. And it also happily retains our acronym, TAF. So we'll be known as TAF Coalition. We'll still all be TAF netters and, uh, as we go forward. Um, I look forward to April, in which we're not going to get all those phone calls. So <laughs> yeah, I we can bet, actually yeah. focus on our mission. I bet. So, I bet. Uh, I, you know, it's very well received by our members. We are right now in Las Vegas for a financial fraud conference that we're hosting under our new name. What a great time to announce this, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is we're here in Las Vegas to discuss financial frauds. Um, it's a great group of people, practitioners, people who've come to learn, our members who've come to learn, um, and learn not only from other members who've been in the trenches uh, uh, filing these Dodd-Frank cases, but also I'm so happy and so impressed by the participation of our government counterparts. There just are so many who are either here in Las Vegas or who will be dialing in virtually. So you mentioned all these new laws that have come online, all these new whistleblower programs. Um, when I was with Taxpayers Against Fraud, the Anti-Fraud Coalition, 10 years ago, there was a False Claims Act in a handful of states. Yeah. And then I came back 10 years later, and it was a different <laughs> organization. I had to learn all kinds of acronyms. Yeah. Yeah. Why are all these agencies and states, why are they passing their own whistleblower programs. Why is everybody moving in this direction? Yeah, at least in the United States, that's for sure. sure. Yeah. Because they're successful. I mean, they're time-tested and proven to be incredibly effective um, tools for fraud enforcement. And not only to uh, uh, reveal and prosecute the frauds, but also to enhance scarce government resources. You know, it's, uh, they're powerful, they're effective, Billions have been collected, obviously, what is it, 70 billion right. yeah. um, on the key TAM side of the ledger and um, over 10 billion on the SEC CFD side. Right, right. So let's take people back a little bit. Uh, a lot of our members and our viewers and our listeners understand where we are today. Yeah. But our history goes back almost four decades. Yeah, right? yeah. That's so, not a little bit. It's it, a it lot. Goes way yeah. <laughs> so John Phillips, yeah, John. Uh, our founder, had this concern. Can you talk about what his concern was and why he decided to launch our organization originally? Well, I think we have to go back and discuss what was happening in the mid '80s in yeah. the in the Reagan years. There was a real run up of the de defense budget, uh, real build up of our defense um, capabilities. And along with that came um, some significant frauds. And at the time, in the day, uh, those frauds were capturing headlines. Things like $500 hammers, $5,000 toilet seats. And John and some others uh, learned about a very old Civil War statute that did have um, a uh, a key TAM mechanism, a mechanism for private enforcement um, of uh, the government fraud law. And he realized the power that was inherent in that, in 
bringing um, to bear the resources of the private bar and the information of people who are on the ground, insiders, um, to stand in the government's shoes, really, initially in filing these cases, and uh, prosecute them if the government didn't, didn't join the case, and to recover monies lost to fraud. Uh, and we all benefited, the taxpayers, you know, the agencies, all that. So that, that was the idea. And he understood in, in founding TAF that, um, that it was a potent law, a potent mechanism, and that it would have um, some very strong opposition, uh, first in uh, the defense industry. And at the time, people really, and you know, I was practicing at the time in the late 80s, um, People hadn't thought really of applying the False Claims Act to healthcare or all these other areas oh, mm -hmm. at the time. It was really the focus was on defense fraud. So that's where people thought most of the fraud was, and that's what people were going after. I mean, that changed very quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but but he understood so wisely that there would be very strong opposition. We've come to call it the fraud lobby, and he was right. He was right. Over the years, as you well know, over the years, we've had a lot of challenges, both, both in uh, lobbying efforts and in the courts. So the organization was, uh, in John's eyes, to be like the guardian of the act. Absolutely. Right? Up on the hill, making sure that the other side's not yeah. uh, undermining what's happening. Uh, you mentioned healthcare. So in the '90s, lab yeah. cases started coming yeah. online, and you know, all these other kinds of cases. Can you talk about that kind of shift that happened uh, during that time? Yeah, it was uh, it was quick. You yeah. know, this period where we thought um, it was going to be primarily defense was really a blink of an eye. Looking back on it, and. Um, you know, it was really, it really did begin with the lab cases. I, I suppose there was one case, um, an ophthalmologist case, or yeah, ophthalmologist mm -hmm. case that um, was filed before against Scripps. But yes, it was the lab cases that really broke that open. And then things really accelerated in the healthcare um, industry hospitals, labs, pharma, you know, the rest is history pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting to look at the numbers today. Healthcare continues to be the lion's share of right. recoveries. Right, right. Of course, yeah. and it makes sense. If you look at the federal budget, yeah. you know, the pie chart, healthcare is the biggest piece of that. But, you know, I mean, it, you you see key temp cases really in every part, whether it's a big healthcare chunk or a little sliver for library books that are purchased by the State Department for, you know, and, and the Defense Department for libraries on um, bases overseas, things like this, or um, highway paving projects, etc. It is everywhere. So let's talk about Stevens. So in 1999, this concerned about the Supreme Court taking up this case, assessing whether or not the key TAM provisions were, were even constitutional, oh. and Taft's role in trying to make sure the court went the right way with that. Can you talk about the anxiety or the concerns about the act at that time, and whether or not the practice could even continue? Well, there, that was the worry, right? Yeah. We thought um, there was significant risk there. Mm -hmm. And I remember, um, you know, going into John... John's office, John Phillips' office, and <laughs> seeing him sitting there really concerned, really worried. I mean, it was all or nothing. If we lost that case, we all would have been wiped out. And as you know, you know, you invest. We, we work these cases for so long. The pipelines are for so many years, and we invest not only our time, but expenses out of pocket. And... Um, you know, there are hungry times, there are good times, but there are many, many years of hungry times. And, um, you know, that case that case could have completely obliterated key TAM practice. Mm -hmm. So, fortunately, the court went the right way. Yes. Right? So the Thanks court, to Taft. <laughs> right. So, so Taft uh, helped secure the, the leading Supreme Court advocate 
uh, Ted Olson. Side, Ted Olson yeah. came and argued the case. Now yeah. he tends to argue on the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll take it when we can. <laughs> at that time, yeah. he was a great advocate yeah. for us, and the court came out and said, all right, the key time provisions are constitutional. Yeah, that was something. And, and then John in the board of Taft said, we need to do a better job educating the public yeah. and the courts and the media and all this stuff and really build up a robust bar that embraces best practices. And ta Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund was founded at that time. Can you talk a little bit about why that was so important, especially coming on the heels of this Supreme Court case? Yeah, well, you do need, I mean, John was right. You need to have practitioners who really understand the law because the fight wasn't just in the Supreme Court. It was on every level of the courts, as we now know so well. And, you know, you want to encourage people also, educate them about the law, encourage them to bring cases, not just healthcare cases, but in every area. So, so yeah, it was, it was important and it was brilliant, really, to have the education fund out there. Um, and really, these conferences that we have now, that TAF puts on annually and now, uh, in not just key TAM, obviously, in financial frauds and other areas are, are really part of that. The seed for that was planted in 2001. So I came on soon after that. Uh, there were 43 <laughs> members. I went back and looked. 43 members. I know. As part I remember. Of, you were uh, just a kid. Uh, very young. <laughs> I was 26 at the time. Wow, well, I'm not saying how old I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was young. Um, and a staff attorney, and there were 43 members, yeah. and we yeah. all fit in a small room at the jury's hotel to talk about uh, That was something. The in the basement of in the, the jury. Basement, the yeah. quarterly review was the size of you know, yeah. this stack of papers. Uh, the bar has grown. Yes, right? it has. Yeah. Yeah, it has. I, I, you know, the bar has grown, obviously. You yeah. add more than a zero on, on yeah. the end of that. Actually... It is, if there were 43, yeah, it is about 430, <laughs> maybe a little bit more than yeah. that. But um, what I love, one thing, uh, uh, one of the many things I love about TAF is that the spirit of TAF really hasn't changed. Sure. You know, the support of the members, uh, the eagerness to help, the eagerness to gain knowledge and to be open. Uh, I've never been in an organization quite like this, yeah. um, and it, it's really something. That that hasn't changed since, mm -hmm. when was it, 2001, 2002, that yeah. first conference that we had? Yeah. That's so true. Yeah, I was talking to a new member recently, and he just called me out of the blue, and he said, so someone had a settlement and was announced to the list, and then all of their competitors <laughs> congratulated them on the listserv. Yeah. Yeah. So was, is that asking? Is that normal? <laughs> yeah, um, it is normal. In fact, it's unstoppable. I remember a few years ago, actually, it's quite a few years ago. It might have been a decade ago, um, when there was um, a concern about too many of these congratulatory <laughs> emails clogging the lister, and people agreed that we would send congratulations to the individuals without sending them to the entire <laughs> listserv. And that lasted about a day. About a day. There, yeah. there was no way to stop it. There is no way. People are just really warm and want to extend their good wishes when yeah. somebody has a success. It's so cool to see. It is so cool. Yeah, yeah. It is Especially so cool. when it's your case. You're like, oh, please, more, <laughs> yeah. more. Uh, yeah. So at this time, um, in addition to the Federal False Claims Act, you know, we're talking 2004, 2005, then the states started coming along. Yeah. There was this law that was passed called the Deficit Reduction Act that gave an incentive to states right. to pass their own state false claims yeah. acts, yeah. and then states took off. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Still a few holdouts, like right. your Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Let's right? fingers crossed we can change that. Yeah. But yeah, what is it now? 30, 33. 33. Yeah. yeah, so... The majority of states now, yeah. uh, for sure. Some, unfortunately, are Medicaid only, but, right. you know, hopefully 
we'll be changing more of those and also adding more of uh, KETAM tax provisions or, right. or eliminating the tax exclusion in more and more states. So you mentioned tax. Yes. So yeah. IRS whistleblower program came online in around 07. Yes, it not, was. Not it, a KETAM provision. But not at all. A, no. a whistleblower program that allows people to report tax fraud above a certain threshold. Can you talk about that program? Yeah, well, actually, there had been a so-called bounty program yeah. with the IRS that actually is nearly as old as the False Claims Act. It was uh, passed around the, the Civil War period also. But, um, and of course, like the False Claims Act, there were many different uh, amendments to it and all. But, um, you know, going into 2006... I think it was at the end of 2006 that the um, new, the IRS program that we know passed. Before that time, awards were discretionary and there were caps. Initially, I think it was as low as $250,000 mm -hmm. and then it went up to $2 million, then to $5 million, and finally I think the, the last cap was $10 million. Mm -hmm. um, but as we know, when you cap awards and you don't guarantee minimums, you're not really incentivizing as many people as you could. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly well-placed people who are well compensated in their jobs are not going to risk their livelihoods or really, in many instances, their personal relationships, as we know, to blow the whistle on a fraud where they would come out... Um, where they're taking all the risk and financially they would be worse off. Um, by the time 2006 rolled around, the False Claims Act, with its mandatory minimums, mm -hmm. you know, non discretionary awards, had a, a, a track record that, you know, we could, we could point to. And uh, Senator Grassley saw the wisdom of it, and uh, the rest is history. In 2006, we got. The, those changes mm -hmm. to to the program, um, and it did encourage people to file. Now there have been problems over the years mm -hmm. with the IRS program. Um, uh, you know, there's a very slow pace of awards. Communication is a problem. One thing about the KETAM mechanism that the IRS program did not have is that the KETAM me mechanism. Um, helps keep cases from languishing. Mm. You know, there's transparency to the courts, um, and w as well as the ability for individuals to take over and litigate the claims. With the IRS, there's none of that. You know, there have been criticisms and concerns that IRS claims um, and submissions go into a black box, and, you know, there's just not sufficient transparency to know what's happened to the claim, to know where it stands, to know um, the basis for awards. Now, some of that is slowly being addressed, um, but the concern remains. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, when you consider um, the tax gap, mm -hmm. um, that could be really the most successful program if it had the right structure. So we're not quite there yet with IRS. Yeah, it always feels like it's not quite living up to its potential. Yes, right? a lot of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. But you know, even on that, TAF is working hard to correct that. Always. Yeah. So in 2009, the FARA amendments were passed, and then the following year, some more amendments were passed to uh, strengthen and modernize the False Claims Act. And people have asked, you know, what were the what was the impact of those amendments? Last year, the majority of the recoveries under the False Claims Act were in decline or non-intervene key TAM actions. First time ever, right? Over yes. a billion dollars yeah. in cases that the relators move forward without the government. Yeah. Just to show the, the impact of those amendments, right? I think that's right. And I think that trend is only going to continue, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, and, you know, it, it, and talking to some people at the Justice Department, they say that this is actually good news. It shows that the act is working as intended. It's supplementing the limited resources of the government. They're trusting a increasingly professional relators bar to move forward with these cases. They're not dismissing them. They're saying right. go forward. And, yes. And we are, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think that that's right. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's only good news. And I think that the capacity 
And the key term bar has grown and the professionalism has grown uh, and the co collaboration and the ability to you know, join forces to litigate these cases has grown um, such that we can bring more and more of these decline cases. So I expect, like you do, that that number will continue to accelerate up or upward. So let's shift to financial fraud. Yes, my favorite. So, uh, Ed, you know, I've told a little bit of my story, but a big reason I went into this area was concerned about SEC fraud. So to see yeah. this happen is really a full circle. Um, in 05, uh, we got a phone call from a gentleman named Harry Markopoulos uh, yeah. raising concerns about somebody named Bernie Mac. He wouldn't tell us the real name. <laughs> and, uh, he was testifying up on Capitol Hill. We're trying to help him out. Um, and the thought about an SEC and then later a CFTC whistleblower program seemed far-fetched. And then the recession of 2008 hit and people are starting to point fingers when Madoff came out, you know, this this fraud. Right. And there was that was just the tip of the iceberg, which okay. led to Dodd-Frank, right? Can you talk a little bit about, I know I reached out to you, reached out to other people, like, can you translate how this could actually play out in the SEC world? Taft's role, your role, and all. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I actually became really interested in fina financial frauds through a False Claims Act case that was some years before mm -hmm. it was, um, my client was Michael Lissack. This was a case against several dozen Wall Street banks for yield burning. It's quite complex, so I, I won't burn time talking yeah. <laughs> about it. But it was about essentially kind of a garden variety mischarging case or overcharging case um, of government securities. And I realized in doing that case um, and working actually very closely with the SEC on that case, I realized the power that this could have um, in, in the SEC arena. At my firm, we were talking about the how we might be able to um, apply a key TAM approach uh, to the securities world. And uh, we didn't succeed in convincing people, <laughs> but, but Madoff and Harry's story were a turning point. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason, of course, is that there were about a half dozen whistleblowers. Harry is the, you know, was, um, the one who kept going back, kept going back, kept going back to the SEC. But there were others also. And when that came out, that the SEC had ignored them, disregarded them, or even worse in Harry's case, when he finally started getting traction with him, but he raised the question about whether he might be able to get an award, and it shut the conversation down. Um, you know, and then the explosive headlines about Madoff mm -hmm. and people realizing, in Congress particularly, realizing that this could have been shut down years earlier yes. if only the SEC had listened. Um, Mary Shapiro, who was chair of the SEC at the time, recognized that, I think, that the SEC had made a mistake and actually herself asked to have a whistleblower program. Um, and that was kind of the start of having um, the SCC, CFTC whistleblower programs incorporated into the Dodd-Frank Act. So uh, in talking to a lot of people, this is, we're coming up on, I think, our 50th show soon. Wow. Well, um, congratulations, yes, but a Jeb. Lot of fun. Yeah. Um, there's been a, a through line of these cases where, but for a whistleblower, the cases will never happen. Yep. And these include SEC cases. Yep. You know, I think of the uh, we had the interview about Nikola Motors, yeah. in which even GE had a due diligence team totally missed that yeah. there was no there there, yeah. and and the SEC missed it. Yeah. But for a whistleblower, and there's multiple cases like that where the whistleblower is the one exposing the fraud, and then nobody else would know but for the whistleblower. Yeah, right? yeah, or nobody else would want to know. You know, true. they're turning away. Yes. Um, but that's absolutely true. It, I mean, it, again, it goes to, back to the force of these um, programs where, you know, the status quo would just be that the fraud would continue. Mm. But for somebody who stands up, who has the courage to stand up and speak out against it, yeah. it's pretty amazing. 
So you have been the person I've turned to for a long time <laughs> on so many things, right? I think about each one of these things, uh, you know, reaching out to you with your help on the IRS and, the, and then the SEC and the CFTC. Before you were even on the board, you know, you were on the President's Council and I'm yeah. calling it's and trying good to times. help. Yeah. Yeah. Erica, translate what yield burning means oh, or gosh. the Gabelli case. What does this mean? You know, all these kind of complex cases. Um, I would like to talk about your career. Uh, you are the first female chair of our organization. And I am honored. I, re- yeah. I am. It's been fantastic, and I, I can't really believe it myself. The, I, you know, I talk to members all the time. So we have 120 female members of our 420. That was not always the case. Yeah, right? yeah. The percentage of female yeah. attorneys going into this area has really taken off. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I think... Um, you know, that's a really good question. I think, um, well, first of all, there are more and more women coming out of law schools, True. right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a fascinating area. I think women can, uh, in some ways, be more nimble. They can be risk takers. Yeah. And I think you need to be a risk taker to really uh, work in this area because it can be unnerving um, at times, as we know. Um, and I think there's such a solid community of women in, in TAF. And when you have that, it just builds on itself. A few years ago, when well, you decided to go to law school. Uh, thank you. You <laughs> flatter me. <laughs> uh, you went to Berkeley Law. I did go to Berkeley Law. Why did you decide to become an attorney? Well, I, I wanted to do good in the world. At the time, I thought I was going to go into environmental law because conservation issues matter a great deal to me. Um, As you know, I'm an animal fanatic, um, and I thought that would be a good fit for me. That didn't happen, obviously. But the timing of my law school career and the fact that I went to um, Berkeley Law was incredibly fortunate because I graduated right after the False Claims Act amendments um, were passed and, and enacted. And um, and John Phillips had gone to Berkeley Law. Yeah. And my mentor at my first law firm was very good friends with John. They were on law review together. And back in the day when, um, when the False Claims Act amendments first passed, John was working for Center for Law and the Public Interest. And he recognized as he started bringing cases that he would need to have kind of the armies of associates that a larger law firm had. And so he turned to his old friend, who happened to be my mentor at my firm, my previous firm, and and, and that individual, his name is Bob Montgomery, really took a risk and advocated for us, that firm, it was Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, to represent whistleblowers um, on a contingency fee basis. Wow. Yeah, yes. I mean, Paul Weiss <laughs> had a great reputation uh, doing pro bono work, mm-hmm. but he'd never taken a contingency fee case before. So, um, so I'm very grateful for that. I was there at the right time with the right people, gone, you know, I, I have to say, went to the right law school where these connections were forged. And um, so, yeah, so we filed, the first case I worked on was a um, case against Raytheon, which mm-hmm. was, <laughs> and then the K, the Singer case. Yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, and from there, what, what happened is that uh, there was a downturn in the economy in 94, mm-hmm. and, and that Paul Weiss, um, even though we had been successful in Singer and they were very pleased by the contingency fee, um, they were concerned about you know the fact that if you are taking these cases on contingency, you're paying out money yes. for a long time before you see any money back. And so the writing was on the wall in, the, in that recession in the 90s that they weren't going to continue supporting this kind of work. Fortunately for me... Um, John and Mary Louise decided to move from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. And so just the timing, you know, I've just, like I said, is serendipity and good fortune. When they came to D.C., I just 
hopped over and, and joined them. And that was 94. 94. That was 94, believe it or not. It's a, it's a long time ago, and I've been there ever since. Steve Jobs had, had this great quote about only looking back did the dots line up. And looking back, you can see yeah, you, know, but, you went to this firm where Bob was, who knew John, and then it all kind of flew. Yeah, yeah, the dots really did line up. Um, you know, I, I think if I could speak to y younger lawyers, I mean, I, I think you'll see in your career that opportunities will be presented to you, and they may seem really risky or kind of outside a strict path. Take those opportunities, yeah. you know. You'll be amazed about where, where you'll go. It's worth it. It really is worth it taking the risk. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's great advice. You know, in t thinking about my classmates in law school, you know, the, the firms come to the school. Yes. They interview at the school. They offer you the money at the school. It makes it so easy, right, to it's so go easy. the defense route. Yeah, it really, and it's seductive too, yeah. you know, and then during that first summer, you're t yes. being taken to wine white tablecloth <laughs> restaurants, being yeah. wined and dined. It really is something. And then, you know, you start your first year and you're stuck in <laughs> reviewing millions of documents. Um, no, I, I, I um, feel like I've had a charm life, a charm career. You know, I'm close to many of my classmates from Berkeley and, um, you know, many of those who are in big law wish they'd gone a different route. They're not particularly happy with their careers. So, yeah, I, I mean, I would encourage um, anybody at any point in their career to, uh, you know, reevaluate, really think about what will make you happy in your practice and, and then go for it. So you... We're really good friends. So I know a lot about you. One of the things I always admire about <laughs> Dear. you is your willingness to travel across the country by car. Why do you do that? <laughs> well, first of all, I I love driving across country. Yeah. I think, you know, growing up on the, the West Coast, living half the year on the East Coast, um, and actually many years full-time on the East Coast, you know, you can kind of get the coastal mentality and think those are the only places to live and that's where the beauty is and that's where, you know, what's happening is. You drive across country and you just see the beauty of, of every place. You know, people disparage Nebraska or Iowa as flat. First of all, they're not flat. And the people are wonderful. If you get off the interstate, I, I happened to recently, my last trip, get off Highway 80 and spend a day in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, have you ever been there? I have, the home of the University of Nebraska. Yes. Yes, yes I have yeah, been there. You have been mm -hmm. there. Yep. Well, first of all, you if you're on Highway 80, yeah. you have no idea no, yeah. that there's this beautiful yeah. city there with one of the most incredible botanical gardens in the country. It was built um, during the Depression. It was a works, what is it, WPA project. Uh -huh. And it was built in the site of the old city dump. And they, I think they call it the Sunken Garden. And it is spectacular. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So you see all these things. And not only the physical, natural beauty, but just, you know, the beauty of the place. I try to stay in touch with that. I try to, um, you know, not get too, cling too closely to the coastal mindset. Uh, you know, I try on a regular basis to read the op-ed um, uh, section of papers in Idaho, in Iowa, you know, Texas. So just to stay in touch. Um, as someone who grew up in a flyover state, right, in a very <laughs> rural part of, of Kentucky, um, I really appreciate <laughs> the connection that you have with yeah. people that you don't realize yeah. that they go through the same struggles. They have the same concerns yes. about their retirement, right? Yes, so absolutely. You know, what we do certainly touches on every aspect of every person in this country, including people in Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah, no doubt realize. about it. No doubt about it. And that's, you know, in, in really pretty much every case, you know, in the pharma cases that I did, the way that people, patients were really used yes. for 
money. It's just, you know, you look at these companies who could do so much good and who do do a lot of good, but then just exploit individuals um, and institutions just for profits. So a lot of your focus in reading your biography and, and studying up for today is beyond the U.S. borders. Yes. Right? You're spending a lot of time talking to other countries, encouraging them to pass laws, and you've had a number of international clients, yeah. whistleblowers, who are bringing cases involving SEC fraud, for example. Um, why do people from across the globe, um, why are they so important in covering fraud that's happening in the United States and that's happening in other parts of the world? Yeah, it is amazing, actually, um, and it, it shows the global reach of whistleblower laws mm -hmm. and the power, again, of, of the incentives. Um, the reason why it's important, particularly in financial frauds, is that the markets are, are global. There's no doubt about it. And moreover, as we'll learn more tomorrow during the FCPA yeah. panel, or on Thursday, rather, in the FCPA panel, you know, there's a lot uh, foreign corrupt practices are by their very nature, international. And the SEC uh, whistleblower program covers a lot of those practices. So yeah, you know, it's, I, I think that we're seeing more interest in by foreign countries, non-US, outside the US, countries outside of the US in adopting whistleblower laws, but um, it's more in terms of protecting whistleblowers from retaliation. Now that's obviously very important, it's critical, it's, you know, anti-retaliation provisions are in each of the statutes that we work under. But there is a real reluctance overseas to, in most countries, to adopt financial incentives. And I spent a long time, a lot of time in the UK speaking with policymakers in various agencies, be it the Financial Conduct Authority, Home Office, uh, Treasury, and they were very interested in the mechanism. They were extremely interested in how KTAM enhances government resources. Um, but this idea of rewarding people for what policymakers often see as the moral obligation of its citizens is just a sticking point. And What's amazing to me, really, is how blind they are to the fact that their own citizens are flocking yes. to the programs in, in the U.S. because they offer financial incentives, you know. And so they're really out of touch, mm -hmm. out of step, I think, with the mindset of, of their citizenry. You know, I've had many international clients who've said that they would not report to their home regulators because of the lack of protections in many instances and, and a reward because the risks were so, so great. Um, and that, that's really, it's a shame because from what I've seen, oftentimes the misconduct overseas um, is even worse. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit of a wild west, mm. except in the east. <laughs> you, you know, the ultimate irony, of course, is that the UK, Britain, we, we got the whole yes. idea of yeah. the Ketam from them. I know. And, and somehow they've turned their back on what I know. I know. No sense, right? it, makes, it makes no sense. Um, I do think that uh, over time it will shift. Um, and I think the first is this shift towards protecting whistleblowers in, in the workplace. Right. Um, but I, I, think, I think there's still the possibility of getting financial incentives in at least some countries. Mm -hmm. So when you came on board as chair, you identified specific priorities. And as a staff, we use those as our guidepost on yeah. what projects to move forward with. You wanted to build out a wing of our organization devoted to financial fraud. Yeah. We now have over 100 members who do just that, right? They're here attending this conference focused on financial fraud, something you came up with about a year ago. I can't tell you say. how happy I am. Well, you know, it was apparent to me that um, this was a growth area yeah. and that, um, you know, we could do more as an organization 
to develop that practice. I mean, at our conferences, we had, for, for many years, we had had panels uh, that focused on financial fraud. But it is it feels so good to have a defined community with its own listserv with now this first uh, conference, the first of what I hope are a series of annual conferences for many, many years. So yeah. the, the name, the Anti-Fraud Coalition, with its more encompassing yeah. uh, feel to it. So where do we go from here? Where's the organization in 10 years? When, when my daughter, who's looking <laughs> at law school at age 11, she's already talking <laughs> about she how really? she wants to go to law school. Oh, bless and, her. And brings a briefcase to school every day. Not bless out of my she encouragement. Really? Um, she's going to watch this. She's going to see you know, a very strong female attorney who does what I do. Um, what is it going to be like when she's, you know, in, in your shoes? Well, um, as long as TAF exists, yeah. I am confident that um, these laws will be strong and that we will get more and more of them. Um, I think, really, like what I was saying before about the budget, you know, there are just there's so many areas. We were talking... Yesterday, I sent you an email about the Railroad Safety yes, Act. Yeah. I mean, that's an area, there are many areas that kind of cry out for whistleblowers to help enforce, help the government enforce um, the laws that are already on the books, mm. right? And so I, I don't know precisely where the areas are. Yeah. I think that um, perhaps at FTC, I know CFPB was considering, maybe still considering a whistleblower program. Um, it, it could, you know, it's kind of a, it, it can be applied in so many different ways. I do think, as I mentioned, that uh, we'll see more programs overseas. Um, and I think that the newer programs will get more and more traction. For example, anti-money laundering. Mm. So, so where money flows, fraud follows. Absolutely. 100%. You got that right. Yeah. So that concludes today's show. Eric, I wanted to thank you uh, for your time. <laughs> I want to acknowledge your uh, mentorship and leadership and friendship over the years. Really oh, thank that. you, Jeb. Yeah. You're just wonderful. I'm so glad that you're the CEO of the organization. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So, you don't want to miss a single episode. You want to make sure you go over to taf.org, the Anti-Fraud Coalition's website, where you can sign up for our newsletter, where you'll receive information about what's happening in the corporate underworld, and you'll also receive all future episodes of this show. If you believe you have witnessed fraud against the government or fraud on the financial markets, we encourage you to visit our website at taf.org, where you will find a directory of member attorneys who represent whistleblowers across the country. On our website, you will also find additional information about our nation's various whistleblower laws and programs and a way to donate to our organization as we step forward in spreading information about whistleblower programs. This episode was edited and produced by Rachel Brooks, and our theme song is by Connor Chaos. A big thank you to our TAF staff and researchers of James King, Emma Bass, Jackie DeMar, Kate Scanlon, Max Boldman. Fraud in America is a project of Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund. The opinions expressed on today's show belong solely to the guest and are not necessarily endorsed by the organization. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Fraud in America.